This video is about deliberative democracy. If you notice the, the title of Chapter 9, Deliberative Democracy in the Defense of the Public Realm, it signals to the reader that deliberative demo the deliberative democracy model is one that aims to improve the quality of democracy. It aims to enhance the nature and the form of political participation rather than just increasing democracy for its own sake. Those who argue for deliberative democracy and argue for informed debate, the public use of reason, and the impartialist pursuit of truth believe in this sort of deliberative model. Now, Held says that the principles of justification for this model, model nine, um, is the following. The terms and conditions of political association proceed through the free and reasoned assent of its citizens. The mutual justifiability of political decisions is the legitimate basis for seeking solutions to collective problems. What does this mean? It's saying that the main way that governance happens is through the free and reasoned assent or agreement of the citizens. In other words, citizens solve problems by freely discussing and debating the issues using reason. Because citizens are able to do this freely, and because they have the opportunity to come to conclusions about the best solution, the process, because of this process, the solutions or decisions are more justifiable or legitimate. Now, informed debate and the public use of reason is important here. Deliberative Democrats believe that decisions should be made after citizens take time for refined and reflective thinking before stating their preferences, before stating what their conclusions are. But what does it mean to be reflective and rational in your thinking? Often Proust and two of the theorists argue that a rational judgment is one that meets three criteria. First, it must be facts regarding, so not based on emotions, but based on science. It must be future regarding, so not a narrow or backwards looking type of um, thinking, so not based in tradition. And it must be other regarding, so it can't be selfish or individualistic. Now, they believe that whenever problems occur in political judgment, it is because one of these three criteria have not been met. So the judgment may fail because it is uninformed or it is short-sighted or it is self-interested. This in turn raises the question, should ideas and feelings that occur in everyday life be considered fully formed and reasonable or should they be questioned? If they should be questioned, are they only regarded as, as legitimate if they meet tests? of impartiality. So this leaves us with a theoretical dilemma. Is the democratic conception or idea of the common good only about the aggregation of individual preferences, or can the idea of the common good be part of serious public debate? Here, the focus is on the procedures on, of democracy that focus on creating careful and socially validated and justifiable choices or preferences. With, with other models, we've talked about legitimacy coming from the will of the people as an individual, but here legitimacy is coming from the process. Now the difference with deliberative democracy is that the source of legitimacy is, is in this process of forming the will of the people. It's in the deliberation or the discussion itself. And it's in the learning process that citizens undertake to understand the issues and come to thoughtful and reasonable political judgments. Now, the conclusion of this type of thinking about the process of democracy is that the designs of the political institutions must be based on the principle of reciprocity. Now, the idea of reciprocity means that we, as citizens involved in deliberation, must be willing and able to look at issues from different points of view. And we have to be able to defend our own views in a complex social setting. In other words, rather than just saying, well, that's just what I believe, you need to be able to articulate, you need to be able to clearly specify the reasons for your preferences 
and demonstrate an understanding of other people's points of view. This means that built into the process of politics is the opportunity to learn and test publicly, test publicly in the public forum different citizens' views. This also means that the quality of citizenship must be improved or upgraded. And so this raises this question, do we need to improve the quality of citizenship? Now, Fishkin is one of the pioneers of deliberative democracy, and he argues that democracy, as it currently exists, offers a forced choice between politically equal, but uninformed and apathetic masses, um, and politically unequal or elitist political parties that are relatively more competent and informed. So we have the apathetic citizens or masses, and we have the political parties who are elitist and politically unequal, but they have more information. So although formal equality or equality in law has grown over the years, this has been accompanied by a disinterest or apathy about the political process. And Fishkin says that political debates are largely superficial, ill-informed, and without thought. Now, the combination of voter apathy and the superficialness in the political debate among politicians means that there is an emphasis on politicians' personalities rather than on policy. Sound bites replace arguments here. Celebrity glitz displaces principled polit political argument. And candidates are chosen as if we are choosing just detergent or shopping around for the right politician. Um, now, politics has become, he says, Fishman says, politics has become shallow, media driven, mean, and empty of ideas and high quality leadership. Others have critiqued democracy in a similar way, but Fishkin sees the problem as a reason for an imaginative rethinking of democracy that has new, that includes new ways of participating. And it's one that gives citizens more power and more opportunities to use this power thoughtfully. Another theorist, John Elster, argues that politics has become about consumer choice, so like market relations, because collective decision making is now about the aggregation of private preferences rather than working together to come up with the best ideas. Consumer choice is self-regarding. That is, that it's about it's about what is best for you personally rather than society as a whole. So politics or political choice should be other regarding, where consumer choice is self-regarding. A third theorist, John Dryzak, his view is that the problem with democracy is in the dominance of instrumental rationality or formal goal-oriented rational thinking which he says has led to bureaucratization and a concentration of power in the hands of technically skilled elites. In other words, politics has become only for the experts. Experts tend to break down complex problems into their component parts and deal with them in isolation rather than looking at them as part of a complex whole. And so this prevents a complex holistic approach to government. Another theorist, Jürgen Habermas, argues that rationality can be used both for looking at the component parts of a problem, but also for ensuring the social coordination of action by developing a body of norms to guide participation and deliberation. To do so, Dreisek, going back to Dreisek, says that we need to strengthen our ability to discuss and deliberate and seek collective solutions to our collective problems. So we can ask here this question, is deliberative democracy different from other forms of direct or participatory democracy? Now, Hell says, yes, it is. He says that neither direct or, nor participatory democracy are necessarily deliberative. They do not work towards improving the quality of citizenship, and there are logistical problems to implementing them without improving the quality of citizenship. And this brings us to this question of what constitutes sound reasoning. The focus is on how to determine whether something is right or just. In deliberative democracy, we 
cannot just accept the practices of, of citizens because, as we've, as we've already said, the aim is to create a process for examining ideas and opinions about common problems. It's a process that's intended to provide a space for thinking about um, big or holistic issues by assessing things impartially. Being impartial means being open to, reasoning from, and assessing all points of view before deciding what is right or just. It's not just simply about following your own self-interest. So the idea of impartialism is about the equal consideration of all interests. There needs to be space for opinions to be examined rationally and without judgment. And that examination needs to be done from an impartial moral standpoint. So this means that in making an argument for or against something, you have to move beyond simply stating, I believe, or I think it's fair, or it belongs to the male prerogative, or I want it because I'm angry. You must be able to defend any claims or principles from a larger social standpoint, not simply from a personal standpoint. Now, impartialist reasoning is something that should be seen as a tool for testing viewpoints and principles, along with their justification. So this form of reasoning can be a way of testing or criticizing partial or one-sided views, principles, and rules that can't be generalized or universally shared. In this way, then, impartialist reasoning is the foundation or basis for thinking about problems created by things like unevenly distributed power and resources or wealth, and by prejudices such as racism and sexism. Because this reasoning is being done in public, the argument is that there is improved legitimacy. The more people can see the logic of it as right or correct, and then can come to an agreement or consensus. Of course, there's critics of this. Now, critics of impartialism argue that impartialism is simply too abstract and too narrow about what constitutes a good argument, and that the conditions that are needed for deliberation are simply unattainable. It's impossible to be able to perfectly see all points of view without any judgment. Instead, there needs to be a better understanding of the nature and meaning of deliberation under non-ideal conditions. Now, these critics believe that you can never truly get rid of conflict over public choices, nor that self-interested actors will suddenly become altruistic. They believe that moral disagreements are simply something we must learn to live with. Conflict over issues like law and policy is more than simply about self-interest because moral conflicts cannot always be resolved by an appeal to the facts or by an analysis of relevant concepts. Because it begs the question, which facts should be counted as relevant? Which concepts should be used? For many theorists of deliberative democracy, there's disappointment that universal suffrage, which is, um, you know, everybody having the, 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 the right to vote, um, and because we have 100% literacy and free education and a free press, there's disappointment that even though we have all these things, and we have a multiplicity of political parties, we have not seen a flowering of democracy. So many of these theorists are critical of the behavior of both citizens and politicians. They're critical of the political process. They're critical of the quality of decision-making. And perhaps above all, they are critical of the quality of political discussion and debate. So they're analyzing not only institutions, but also the crucial aspects of wider, the wider culture within which these institutions operate. Now, unlike some earlier critics of liberal democracy, these theorists are looking to improve democracy, not get rid of it. To do this, um, they do this by identifying the problems in our current process, uh, challenging some of the core assumptions of democratic theory to date, they focus particularly on the process of opinion formation and the form and ethos 
of our po public political discussion. So they end up suggesting a series of reforms and experiments to bring about a revival or refreshment of citizenship and a higher quality of democratic pro um, practice. So we have this disappointment, we have cynicism and disillusion that the rights, literacy and free education and free press have not led to better democracy. Um, and there's no agreement on exactly what a future with a deliberative model might look like. Now, a lot of these ideas may feel familiar. You know, in our newspapers, we read all the time about political cynicism, widespread disillusion with the political process, the apathy and lack of engagement of ordinary citizens, and so on. Although at first one might guess that a kind of disdain for democracy that we have right now and for the judgment of the mass of citizens would be associated with elitism, in practice, many of the writers of deliberative democracy have, a, have radical prescriptions, which lead in a much more egalitarian direction. So for them, the solution to the problem of democracy is more and better democracy, not getting rid of it. Held says we need an imaginative, imaginative rethinking of democracy that offers a new kind of participation. Now, we don't have detailed agreement on what this future would look like if it was transformed by deliberative, deliberative practices. Um, but, you know, it is something that we can think about and debate and maybe build on as Cal does uh, in the subsequent chapters. Now, we can reflect on whether deliberation provides avenues for deepening political participation within the existing um, patterns of representative politics. We can also ask how far can deliberation be regarded as transforming reasoning um, and whether or not it leads to a genuinely new model of democracy. And how it leaves us with three final questions. Um, these are the core questions around which all deliberative dem Democrats make their case. So why deliberate? Who deliberates? Where should deliberation take place? And when can it be concluded that deliberation has been successful? Now, there are some similarities between this model and model A. Um, so the new left uh, also advocates for, advocates for a greater level of discussion, participation, and control by ordinary citizens. Um, Model 8 is really a vision of citizenship attempting to retrieve central elements of democracy from what is regarded as unacceptable levels of compromise and corruption. But it doesn't really give answers to hard questions about how to achieve this and in a, how to achieve this improved form of democracy. With deliberative democracy, the range of institutional reform and experiment is really simply an attempt to answer these types of questions. Now, the analysis of liberal democracy moves beyond simply looking at institutions to consider culture, the culture in which these institutions are embedded. And so deliberative Democrats end up challenging the political discourse and they are really aiming to completely change the way in which citizens form opinions, state the preferences, negotiate the differences, and make political demands. Now, the article um, that I assigned for this particular topic, um, I sort of regret it assigning it, in fact, um, because it is actually poorly written and edited. But it, the reason I assigned it is because it looks at the practical real world uses of deliberative democracy. Now, the authors recap many of the same ideas as in the textbook, and they apply them to in order to think through how the theory can be used in practice. They point out that the use of public deliberation is about the process of making difficult choices between many alternatives in order to find the best choice for the community as a whole. It illustrates some of the challenges of using a deliberative process and the importance of decision makers in supporting the process of deliberation. And the authors just conclude that effective, um, in order for it to be effective in promoting good governance practice, we need to have public deliberation that bridges, um, that builds a bridge between citizens and policymakers. And it can help us to resolve conflict if there is a strong sense of belonging among the participants. 
So read this article, keeping in mind the questions that Hal raises at the end of the chapter. Is deliberative democracy a, a paradigm shift? In other words, does it actually radically change the way in which politics and policy decision making is done? Will it work when making decisions about deeply moral or ethical issues? Is it possible to have a truly fair procedure? And really, the, the debate is going to continue. So this ends the video on deliberative democracy.